Hello, my friends. Good evening. Welcome to the Mythical Land Library. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Book Talk. Tonight we're doing episode six. We're talking about ancient Irish tales. Hope you're all keeping safe and well. A very good evening to Daisy Peters, who's the first of the commenters on YouTube tonight. Hello, Daisy. Daisy is very excited and glad to join with us. And here we go. Mandy McCurl, who got a mention on last night's impromptu broadcast, says, hope everyone is keeping well. Presently attending a webinar on catamarans and their benefits to the island. See you later. Okay, Mandy, we look forward to seeing you when you're finished with your catamarans. Deborah Williams says, hi, Daisy. And hi, everyone from Hillsborough, Maryland. Hoping everyone's feeling well and doing fine. All good here so far, Deborah. Uh, who else? Mez Marion is there, says, hi, Anthony and all. Gladly joining for stories. Taking a break from a wonderful Om Kiltern day. Lovely for listening and feeling, transmuting, releasing, repeat. Blessings with us always. With us all always. Thanks, Mez Marion. Welcome along. That's the commenter so far on YouTube. On Facebook, Sandra Boothroyd says, good evening, sir. When everyone says, sir, I always feel like going, good evening, sir. Evening, Sandra. Jackie, whose name is spelled J-A-C-Q-U-I-E, says, hello, August Faskerma, August uh, Ortfain. Jackie, welcome. Paul Nethercott is in the house. Hello, Paul. Good to see you. Manon Frenzen Borsboom says, hello. Hello, Manon Falje. Paul says, still need Irish whiskey. Well, I have a bot just between us now. Just between us. Uh, I have a bottle of Jemison in the press, but that's just strictly between you and me, Paul. No one else is to know that. Paul Alborl says, good day from Daphne, Alabama, USA. Hello, Paul. Good evening to you. Good afternoon. Sheila Gum says, hello from Canada. Falje, Sheila. Great name. Uh, Arch DB says, hi all. Falje. Brady M. Tussey says, greetings to Anthony Slauncha, Brady. Porigo Komsky said, Hi, Anthony. I had the most amazing experience up on the Cooley Mountains and looking across to Schlieve Gullion. Yes, I saw your photo just before I went live. Fantastic stuff, Porig. With your permission, I might share that to the community later. You might share it yourself, actually. Uh, ArchDB says, too cloudy tonight. Yeah. I did get a brief glimpse of the, the moon and Orion last night, but uh, by the time the clouds parted it was very late in the night and the moon had already slipped off into the feet of gemini and hurley says hello to all the beautiful people well and i want to know what, what about us ugly ones <laughs> hello to you debbie mcdonald says hello falsha debbie such a sublime sunset says porrick some of the best sunsets are in the winter time in ireland mona andrus says good hello and greetings great topic well i hope you enjoyed Anne mccallum is in the house Hello, Anthony. Hope you slept better last night. Book talk. Yay, I did actually sleep better last night. Yeah. Sandra Boothroyd says, that's the respect for your wonderful talks. Nobody, no, no, nobody should call me Sir Sandra. Uh, it's perfectly okay to call me Anthony. Eric, a river tree is in the house. Says Banachti, O Louisville, Kentucky. Falcha Trinonoa, Erica, welcome along. Desiree Riley is in Louisiana and says hello to Anthony and all the tour. Slauncha, Desiree, great to see you. Paul Garron is in the house and says hello to all the wonderful folk. And what about us less wonderful ones? Paul, it's good to see you. Lara Joe says hi from Malta. Good evening to Malta from the Boyne Valley. Barb Jordan says hello, everyone. Giorich Barb. Jacinta Paisley says hi, Anthony and all. Got the calendar and it surpasses seeing it from your room. Thank you so much. Well, thanks indeed, Jacinta. Glad that it has arrived safely, and I hope you greatly enjoy it. I'm terribly sorry. I'm sucking on a lozenge because my throat has been quite dry for the past day or two. And tickly. No, 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 don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. It's kind of phlegmy too, and I've had a runny nose today and sneezes, so it's uh, it's not you-know-what. In any case, you're perfectly safe because you're on the other side of the phone. <laughs> Julie King says hello to you all. Fall to Julie. Kaylee During is in the house. I love seeing you live this much. Hopefully you had a good night's sleep yesterday. Yes, indeed. Although um, with what's going acro on across the water, I, I don't know how anybody in the U USA is sleeping right now. But anyway, don't even go there, says you. Don't go there. Paula Snow Queen says out shopping, but tuning in. 
Well, I admire your commitment, Paula. Great to see it. You're welcome along. Peter O'Connor says, Sloan, you're from Sydney. Hello, Peter. Good morning to you uh, from a very cloudy and muggy night here in the Boyne Valley. I hope the weather's nice in Sydney. Zandru Reguera says, hello, Anthony and all from Argentina. Fantastic. Good evening. Good afternoon to Argentina from Ireland. Debbie McDonald says, how about Sir Anthony? No, 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 no. I insist. No, 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 no formal titles. Please, no. Uh, Miriam Ma Miriam Magoud, Magoud. I, I don't know how to pronounce that surname, but Miriam, please, you might tell me. Says, good afternoon from France. Thanks for all. Bonsoir. Miriam, welcome along. Amy Wallace Dolan says, good evening all. Falja, Amy. And Anne, Anne McCallum says, my sore throat is from all the screaming at the TV. <laughs> mm, yes, I know. US is not sleeping well, I, I, I can imagine. Anne Scott Doherty says, hello all. Hello, Anne. Helen Guinan is in the house and says, one is here. Your Majesty. Was that enough? I bow to your graciousness. Darren Egan says, if ever a reason for Jemson, a tickly dry throat. Right, crack open the jemmy. <laughs> Ellie Redabow says, hello, hello. Great diversion from politics here in the US. Love hearing you. Well, <coughs> thank you. Is it Ellie or Eli? Thank you very much. You're very welcome along. Esther David says, hi, Anthony. Never in fault you, Esther. Chris Haney Lang says, is saying hello from a very warm Arizona. Send a little bit of it over in this direction. Deborah Allen says hello from Wisconsin in the USA. Hello, Deborah. Paul Blockley says, hi, everyone. Not been able to watch as much recently. Good to see you're still going, Anthony. Oh, sure, look, there's no stopping me, you know. Um, they, we're, that's why we appreciate your Mythflex readings and book talks. Had about all I can take of American media right now, says Desiree. I can understand. April Michael Freed says, hello from Michigan. I'm oh, very sorry. I'm still sucking the lozenge. I will finish presently. Ryan Murphy, another Murphy in the house, says, glad to see you tonight from Inishow in, in Donegal. Big shout out to all of our friends in Donegal. Connors uh, thought too, Ryan. You're very welcome. Diana Soriano is in the house. Hello, Falchi. Archeo Stormy Database, not sure if I gave you a shout. Diana says she's in Spain. Hola, and welcome to Live I'm nearly finished. Welcome to Live Irish Mints. Stephen Walker says hello from a very tense Atlanta. I don't think there's a state in the States at the moment that isn't tense in some way. The past, the present, and the future walked into a bar. It was tense. Don't laugh. Don't encourage me. Uh, the Full Irish GK, Toronto Walk. Good evening, all. I paid a visit to on Rockdale, Rockdale Hillfort, then Kylefort, Cashlon, Amrira, Castle Ruddery, Stone Circle. Brilliant. This is an amazing little land we live upon. Absolutely, it is. The Curious Celt says, Hi, Anthony, all the good folks. Looking forward to story time, as we are. Gillian Stapleton says, Hello, Anthony, and everyone. Hello, Gillian. Falls you. Welcome along. Sandy McNabb says, I like it intense. Charlene says, don't sure how to comment on YouTube, but on TV, but headed over here to say hi. Hello, Charlene. No problem. Esther David, did I mention from London? If I didn't, if I did, hello again. If I didn't, hello. Okay. That was great. Tuned in as you were saying something about your majesty, says Burr Whelan. Lol. Hi, Anthony, and hi, everyone. Hello, Burr. What time are we on? We're, oh, it's your Lumber Grant. We're, we're early tonight. 9.25. Book talk, six. Good. So tonight, um, so I told you with book talk, I take a book off the shelf. And we do a little bit of chat about it. And of course, an episode of Book Talk wouldn't be an episode of Book Talk without actually reading a passage from said book. Tonight, I chose Ancient 
Irish Tales. Edited, it says, I'm not sure how much of it was written by them. Uh, I'm assuming they're actually the, the joint authors, uh, that they didn't just edit it, because I don't think there are uh, bylines, as it were, uh, authors' names on each of the individual sections. There aren't. Uh, edited by Tom Cross and uh, Clark Sl Slover. It's, this, it's an interesting one, because you expect Clark to be a surname, and Harris can be a surname. Tom P. Cross and Clark Harris Slover. Anyway, it's quite a magnificent tome. It runs to a total of uh, over 600 pages. It has a nice dust jacket on it with this beautiful image of... Uh, do you know, I... Like, when you look at that for a moment, you think of the great circle stones at Newgrange, but that's not where it is. I'm not actually sure where it is, uh, with the almost full moon or just past full moon. But anyway, if you take the dust jacket off, it's, a, uh, again, you can see it's a beautiful hardback book. And it has worn very well. Ancient Irish Tales, Barnes and Noble. Anyway, if you're looking for a copy of it, uh, the original was published in 1936 by Henry Holt and Company. And this is a 1996 reprint by Barnes and Noble. Um, now, I have to tell you that from a sort of a... I have the book in my hand right now, says Julie King. Well, look at you. Brilliant. Um, it, it, it's quite valuable because it is a, it's one of those books that it's a great... It serves as a great introduction to the stories. And it covers a decent swathe of the... Uh, the, the various um, uh, the uh, the various cycles and I actually bought this book this was sort of one of my early purchases after I had started uh, researching uh, all of the myths and the monuments and the alignments with Richard Moore uh, back in the year 1999 and of course need you don't need reminding but that culminated in 2006 with the publication of the first edition of Island of the Setting Sun in search of Ireland's ancient astronomers, uh, which was again reprinted in 2008 and has just been reissued. Having been out of print for quite a long time, has been issued as a 2020 edition with a new preface um, and is bigger and better than it ever was before. Just to give the plug, and as always, when I plug things, uh, if you don't mind, I'll share the link uh, as to where you can buy a signed copy of the 2020 edition of Island of the Setting Sun. Anyway, I purchased um, Ancient Irish Tales in September of 1999. At that time, I had a very sparse and paltry collection of books in the Mythical Ireland Library. In fact, uh, sometime, if you've got nothing else to do, that is... I've pasted in that link as a comment. Uh, if you go back over the years through my YouTube videos, you will see in in YouTube videos as early as 2008, uh, you'll see in the background these tiny little shelves with books on them. And, um, and then in the High Man video, you'll see Richard in front of a bookcase with books behind him. And, and I think this is one of them. Well, it def almost certainly is. And then over the years, you know, I had to add more and more shelves. And eventually this year, um, it went wall to wall because that was just the way uh, things were going. Ancient Irish tales can be acquired. Somebody just said there, who was it? Uh, Julie King says she got it in a charity shop for two euros. Yep, yeah, always keep an eye out uh, for secondhand copies in charity shops. Secondhand copies online are a bit more expensive. Uh, in fact, um, what is it? Um, somebody recommended, is it the book? No, no bookshop.org no what, what was that um website that has been set up as a sort of a competitor to amazon i didn't realize i've been recommending abe books for months and nobody told as an alternative to amazon and uh, nobody told me that uh, it had been bought ages ago by amazon now, it's not that I, you know, have anything particularly against amazon but it's just a lot of people like to support smaller uh, sellers and that and I know smaller sellers have uh, shops with Amazon but people always like to have alternatives can't see one there on bookshop.org let me just try ABE books just for a moment 
uh, before we get going. Ancient Irish Tales. Uh, there's copies on there in the UK for eight pounds sterling, starting at eight pounds. Um, so, yeah, go and grab yourself a bargain. So one of the things about Ancient Irish Tales is it is actually a reasonably scholarly uh, translation of the stories. It's not, I don't think, it. it I think it leans towards a more s s scholarly um, output than a uh, popular output. So uh, sometimes you'll see popular uh, works on mythology that perhaps aren't recommended by scholars. Um, this one is reasonably good. The one difficulty with it is that it is translated into this rather archaic English. Um, we know thee not, answered Yochi, yet thee in truth I know well, he replied. So you get the gist. That's the uh, the kind of language that's used in it. However, um, because it's accessible and because you can get secondhand copies cheap, it's a very good primer. It's a very good starting place, along with the likes of James McKillop's Celtic Dictionary, Thomas Kinsella's translation of the Toyn, Charles Squire's um, uh, Celtic mythology, um, what's his name? Uh, not Westrop. Um, Oh. Rolleston, Rolleston's uh, uh, Irish mythology, and of course Lady Gregory, uh, with the usual um, caveats that some of those, Squire for instance, and Lady Gregory definitely not considered scholarly works. I'm not sure why Lady Gregory gets such a hard time, I understand that in scholarly circles nobody would touch her with a barge pole, but I have compared for instance uh, her rendering of Tuchmark Emere the wooing of Emer. I was very interested in that story because I uh, there's a section of it that refers to the Dagda killing the the underwater Murashelke, uh, uh, the um, like a giant tortoise or sea monster, which I assumed to be a variation on the story of the Mata. And I wrote about that for Mythical Ireland uh, in my chapter about the Mata, and. Her, her translation and her rendering of Tukmark Emera held up very well, in my opinion. So I don't disregard Lady Gregory uh, to the extent that maybe some scholars do. The other thing, too, is that it's always helpful to have as many renderings as possible, because if you go to the scholarly works, then you can see what has been sort of added or what has been um, uh, accentuated um, what has been decorated a little bit with extra padding, as it were. Um, so it's good to have, I think, uh, a number of different renderings. Anyway, I'll read out from the blurb, as it were, the uh, the inside of the cover um, to give you an idea what's covered within. And then we'll do a little bit of dipping in and out of sections of it. Alan Hoskins says, Hi all from County Tipperary. 2021 is looking better already. Our mythical Ireland calendar arrived today. Loving the book docs. Brilliant stuff, Alan. Glad to hear that it arrived uh, safe and quickly. That's brilliant news. Um, Anne Hurley, he says, I work in a charity shop. Does it have a book section? I tell you, I would never be out of it, you know. I feel someone had a major clear out and I just got very lucky. I've been in that situation, Julie, quite often. Uh, I go to, I, I think I've said it a number of times on the, on the, on the, uh, the live streams that uh, I spend quite a lot of time in charity shops, mostly in the book section, it has to be said, uh, looking for those little bargains that you find, you know. Uh, Ralph say, says that all the Roscommon charity shops are closed, no rooting for treasures. Indeed, St. Vincent de Paul's shops in Drogheda here, and I think the other charity shops are also closed. I can't understand for the life of me how a charity shop is not deemed an essential service uh, in the lockdown. Uh, like, I understand we're trying to protect people. I understand that. And I understand the buying of books could be considered a, a frivolous activity. Uh, it's not like food that you need. You know, it's not like the essential supplies that you need for your house, etc. But remember that when you buy uh, for two or three euros a, a book in St. Vincent de Paul, that book has been donated for free by the person who gave it. And the proceeds of that book sale go to somebody who's less well off. So what can I say? Ancient Irish tales, readers of this comprehensive collection of epic and romantic literature 
can look forward to well-chosen examples of the three main cycles of early Irish literature, as well as two romances and sagas that don't fall into any of the main cycles, but are still rich in early Irish tradition. Found in the book's first part, titled Tales of the Tua de Danon, are stories that belong to the first, the mythological cycle. The Tua de Danon, brackets, peoples of the goddess Danu or Anu, close brackets, were learned in arts and magic and are depicted as strong and beautiful beings, not quite gods, but not ordinary mortals either. Believed to have come to Ireland from the north of Europe, they lived in a dis district along the River Boyne near Stacallan Bridge and in the fairy mound of Femin in County Tipperary. Now that's very interesting, right? Because, uh, which of the scholars was it? Uh, was it O'Donovan in the uh, Ordnance Survey letters? Uh, erroneously identified Stacallan Bridge, which is between Slane and Navan, several miles west of Brunabonia, uh, as the location of Brunabonia, incorrectly. Uh, but of course, we now know that Brunabonia uh, is uh, Newgrange and its companion uh, monuments in the Bend of the Boyne, uh, several miles to the east of Stacallan. So that's very interesting that uh, they're basically repeating uh, what was believed in, in some archaeological circles at the time. I always love that phrase, archaeological circles, because a lot of uh, monuments in Ireland, prehistoric and medieval, are circular. Part two, called the Ulster Cycle, consists of sagas and tales that deal with the traditional heroes of what is now Eastern Ulster. In these ancient sagas, readers will meet the powerful Ulster king, Conchobar or Crohor Macnessa, and his band of chosen warriors, which includes Fergus MacRoig, Brickrew of the Poison Tongue, Kafad the Druid, and most famous of all, the youthful Cúchulam, the subject of some of Ireland's finest heroic tales. And of course, we've seen all of those names, haven't we, mentioned in various episodes of Live Irish Myths. A highlight of the Ulster stories are the many references to ancient manners and customs. Continued on the back flap. The Finn cycle of tales comprises the book's third part. Irish annals provide numerous tales of Finn, and though they differ greatly in their conceptions of him, all regard him as the chief of a warrior band whose heroes include his son, Oshin and grandson, Oscar. Interestingly, they render Oshin, uh, Ossian, O-S-S-I-A-N, uh, but uh, the Irish spelling will be O-I-S-I for the N. This lively section will make it clear why the exploits of Finn and his companions have formed a part of the popular culture of Gaelic-speaking Ireland and Scotland for several centuries. Also included in the volume are tales of the traditional kings, with one about the king of the leprechauns and another story about royal gluttony, among others. The story of the voyage of Bran, son of Fevel, and place name stories. There are a few place name stories. And in fact, it was in on that point, and this is very important, Jennifer Foley sneaking in. Don't worry, better late than never. Um, Amy says, anyone know how long it might, might take the calendar to reach the UK from time of order? It certainly should be um, uh, within a week, uh, Amy. Anything longer is a little bit unusual, but it depends where in the UK and it depends on, I suppose, many factors. The COVID situation hasn't, in my experience this year, delayed mail uh, I, I've dispatched books to the states and calendars. To, to the, none of the states' calendars have arrived yet, but certainly uh, I've, I've dispatched books which have arrived in the states within six days. So uh, it would be a strange situation if it didn't arrive in the UK within within a week. Helen says that she leaves the crown at home. Well, of course, one wouldn't want to be carrying that sort of uh, wealth around on one's head in public, among the hoi polloi, you know. Uh, Sai B says, I'm from near Tipperary Town. Very good. Great part of the world, Tipperary. Tubladorn. Darren Egan says, stones could be piper stones in the Wicklow, in Wicklow. Florence is saying hello from France. Bonsoir, Florence. 
or Ath or Ath counted down. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it was in the very last section of the book, um, place name stories, and there are only a small selection of place name stories, obviously taken from the Dunchanicus, and we now know from having discussed the Dunchanicus in lots of episodes of Live Irish Myths uh, that there's a huge amount of Dunchanicus material contained in diverse. Uh, manuscripts, the metrical Dinchenicus, the Rhein Dinchenicus, the Bodleian Dinchenicus in Oxford, etc., etc. But it was here that I found the story first of the, the mysterious Lech Ben at Brunabonia and the monster, the Mata. Uh, and that was in the story of Auclea. And also the story about the formation of the Boyne, about Bowen, and how she approached the well of Nechten. Uh, illicitly going around the well thrice with her shins or thrice tull, not jeshel, the way she was apparently supposed to go, entering an all-male do domain and causing the well to overflow and form the Boyne River. So we'll read the story anyway briefly about Auclea. Auclea Colon, which is the old uh, Irish name many of you will know, I hope, for Dublin. Hurdles of wattling the Le Leinster men made in the reign of uh, Mescara, under the fleet of the ship of Ahirne, the importunate, when delivering them to Dun Eter, at the place in which Alan Eter was taken from Ulster's warriors, where also Mestedad, son of Amergin, fell by the hand of Mesgegra, king of Leinster. So from those hurdles, Auclea, the ford of the hurdles, was named. And as is always, al almost always the case with the Dinchanicus, there are, are two alternative uh, uh, explanations for the place name. The second explanation, or thus, Auclea. When the men of Aaron broke the limbs of the Mate, M A T A E, the monster that was slain on the Lake Ben in the brew of Mach Og, they threw it limb by limb into the Boyne, and its shin bone, Kulpha, got to Inverkulpha, the estuary of the Boyne, whence Inverkulpha is said. And the hurdle, Clea, of its frame, i.e. its breast, went along the sea, following the coast of Ireland, until it reached Yon Ford, Awe, where or whence Awe Clea is said. And of course, in terms of uh, uh, Inverculpa, or Inverculpha, depending on which version you read, uh, there are two stories, one pertaining to the origin of its name, one of which is, of course, um, uh, about the monster's shin bone or its shank and the other um, is that it was named after the brother, the Milesian brother Kulpa, the swordsman who uh, was drowned when the um, when this tempest, when the storm was raised at sea after the Milesians had arrived in Ireland and made an agreement with Macol, Macecht and Magrania the three Dedanan kings at Tara that they would actually go back out to sea by a distance of nine waves. And the promise was that if they could land again, the land would be given to them by the Dedanans, and that's what happened. But not before great disaster struck them in terms of uh, uh, you know, losing several of their kin, including Dunn. Somebody shared a uh, picture on the community there in the past day or two of Czech Dunn, uh, the house of Dunn off the southwest coast. It's a mysterious rock, a, a, an island of rock in the sea, of County Cork, and uh, apparently at midwinter, when the set sun sets uh, behind the island, uh, it sends a, a sort of a beam or a shaft of light towards the mainland through this mysterious cave uh, that that cuts its way through the rock. It's uh, fantastic, uh, something I've never seen, and something that I wish uh, that perhaps I'll get the the chance to go and see and photograph and maybe video and even live stream. Who who knows? Maybe we'll get that opportunity. Marlin O'Hirmac. Hi, Anthony, and hello to everyone. Good evening to you, Fulcher. Welcome along. We are reading from Ancient Irish Tales by Tom P. Cross and Clark Harris Slover. When more than a quarter of a century ago, Standish Hayes O'Grady presented to the public his well known collection of early Irish tales, he expressed the fear that, quote, a promulgator of such wares, unquote, might be called upon to justify his action. Today, the publication of a volume of translations from Irish 
needs no apology. All who have even the slightest acquaintance with the early literature of Western Europe now recognise the peculiar importance which attaches to the traditions of ancient Ireland. The oldest literature of Ireland has been well called, quote, the earliest voice from the dawn of Western European civilization, unquote. And remember, this is the introduction of the book, and this would have been written in 1936. The significance of this fact has been too often neglected. Not on live Irish myths and, and book talk, it hasn't. The all-conquering Romans looked upon the native speech of the peoples whom they subdued as vulgar tongues unworthy of notice. If any written literature ever existed in the native language of Gaul, none has come down to us. And French, though based on Latin, did not reach the dignity of a literary language until the Roman conquest had taken over for at least a thousand years. In Spain, the earliest national literature was composed not in the language of the most ancient inhabitants, but in a form of Neo-Latin and is no older than the earliest literary compositions in French. In Germanic territory, the beginnings of literature in the German language did not appear until late in the 11th century. So powerful was the influence of the Latin tongue that, in the West, only nations outside the Roman Empire succeeded in preserving any early records of their native speech. Of the Western peoples beyond the immediate sway of Rome, few learned the, the art of writing early enough to record for posterity any native pagan traditions in the vernacular. Chief among these were the Irish, the Anglo-Saxons and the Icelanders. Of the three, the Irish were the first to receive letters and to develop a national literature. And it is perhaps ultimately to Irish influence that we owe the oldest written records in Anglo-Saxon and in Icelandic. So there you go. Yvette Tillema. Hi, Anthony. Hi, Tribe. Reading along. Brilliant. Hello, Yvette. Welcome. Good evening to you. And uh, presumably you know the book this time because, <laughs> yes, that's what, the, that's what the episode is about. It is the proud boast of the Irish people that no Roman legion ever landed on their shores. Ireland never became a Roman province, and thus she preserved her native speech largely unaffected by foreign influences. Ancient Gaelic did not suffer from the contempt with which the older languages were regarded in the Roman provinces. To the early Irish, their tongue was a choice language, and not long after they had learned about the art of writing from the Christian missionaries of the 5th century, they developed a script of their own and began recording their ancient traditions in their own vernacular. Our early Irish manuscripts, though in no case written as far back as the introduction of Christianity, are in many instances copied from texts recorded at least as early as the 8th century, and embodying pre-Christian traditions. So while they may have first been written down in the 700s AD, uh, they referred to pre-Christian and therefore pre-5th century uh, mythological traditions, which, as, as you've heard me say uh, uh, ceaselessly, indefatigably, uh, and almost to the point of na nauseating you, uh, uh, that uh, I believe a lot of those stories go right back into prehistory and some of them all the way back to the Stone Age, the Neolithic, the time when the monuments of the Boyne were built. It includes, sorry, uh, but both in age and in variety, the literature of ancient Ireland surpasses that of any other Western European vernacular during the early Middle Ages. And of course, that uh, is one of the, the key hinging hinge points of Thomas Cahill's theory that the Irish saved civilization, something we discussed in uh, Live Irish Myths, episode three, if I'm not mis... No, episode two, uh, and I'll share that link with you. Um, don't forget that if you're watching on YouTube and you haven't been here before, subscribe, 
Don't forget to subscribe to the channel to get notified of the live streams and, of course, any video uploads. And I will paste that in as a link on Facebook as well. So that is the link to the episode about uh, of Book Talk about how the Irish saved civilizations, uh, civilization. So I'll just read that again because I think it's very important. Both in age and in variety, the literature of ancient Ireland surpasses that of any other Western European vernacular during the early Middle Ages. It includes not only numerous religious and legal writings, but also a large body of lyric poetry and a long list of epic and other tales written in prose alternating with passages in verse. Early Irish epic and romantic literature comprises, in addition to many outlying stories, three groups or cycles known respectively as the mythological cycle, the Ulster cycle or the Red Branch cycle, the Finn or Oceanic cycle. And of course, there is a fourth cycle, and that is the cycle of the kings. Typical examples from all three cycles, as well as a group of outlying romances and sagas, are presented in this volume. Anyway, I guarantee you that if you uh, if you're to buy this, and even I don't know what the new price is, or if it's even still available new, but I, I guarantee you, if you buy it, you won't be disappointed. The only disappointment would be that you might not have sh space on your shelves, which we've identified as a, a common theme among the uh, uh, the Mythflix viewers lately. Uh, it seems to be a, a, a problem that when you build more shelves. You fill them, and when they're full and you're still buying books, uh, the dilemma is always present. Where shall one put one's books? Just don't put them in the shed or the attic where they might get damp. Tales of the Tour de Danon. The, hang on, I just want to make sure I'm up to date on, on the YouTube comments. Angad Kaur says, hi, hi all, late to the party, but happy to be here. You're very welcome along. We're glad to have you here. Um, Sandy McNabb probably came from the Basque Spanish area up the Atlantic seaboard. Yes, there's quite strong connections uh, between Ireland and Spain. Cage Fields in West Coast Ireland, circa 3500 BC. Uh, that is disputed. So there. <laughs> uh, anyway we're not I don't think we need to discuss that tonight but that is actually disputed um, mm, yes it's interesting it was quite a, a rancorous dispute as far as I understand that one scholar is calling into question uh, the whole the whole notion thinks it's much later but anyway perhaps that's a topic for another uh, another episode in the future Tales of the Tua de Danon. The dominating peoples of Ireland's remotest past are traditionally represented as the Partholonians, the Nemedians, the Fervolog, the Tua de Danon, and the Milesians. The accounts of their doings, although ostensibly depicting the very earliest periods of Irish history, were composed for the most part later than the oldest sagas of the Ulster group. The Tua de Danon. Uh, people of, of course, this is all referring to when they were actually written down. You know, that doesn't mean that that's how old they are. Of course, at the time they were written down, they could have already been ancient. The Tua de Danon, the peoples of the goddess Danu or Anu, are said to have come to Ireland from the north of Europe, where they had spent many years in learning arts and magic. And of course, that comes from Laura Gawala, the Book of Invasions. They are represented as large, strong and beautiful beings who mingled with mortals and yet remained superior to them. Their principal residences were Brunabonia, a district along the River Boyne near Stacallan Bridge. No, not correct. The, as we know, that is the district close to Drogheda here uh, in the bend of the Boyne. And the fairy mound, she of Femin in Tipperary. Certain personages in this group, without being definitively labelled as gods, have characteristics that elevate them above the rank of ordinary mortals. Where to order those lovely calendars, Anthony, says Bethany. Uh, yeah, uh, that's not difficult. Not difficult to say. Uh, not difficult that. One moment, please. Uh, I do. Um, the code is getting restless too. Yes, I, of course. Yes, I will mention the dogs. I'm not sure where, but we will. We'll get round to it. Uh, who was asking? That was on Facebook. I'll just paste that link in there, Bethany. 
um, uh, as a comment. Uh, so you can order the calendar online. And despite the fact that the stocks are rapidly depleting, I have ordered more copies from the printer. You'll be glad to hear, so there'll be no problem. My dogs are so happy, says Desiree. Uh, do they hear Coda, I wonder? Are they answering back? Uh, Larissa Kama is saying greetings uh, to the Tua and Anthony from beautiful and tropical Hawaii. Sounds lovely. Uh, um, uh, aloha. I was trying to think of it there. And uh, a very good morning to you. I think it's morning time there, isn't it? It's funny that one of it says Darren Egan. It's funny that one of the stories mentioned a shin bone. Ah, the comments keep disappearing now. How do I see the rest? It's after disappearing now. Hang on till I go back up here now. I want to read that one. It's funny that one of the stories mentioned a shin bone. It could be a connection to ancient peoples of Egypt as it had a special meaning in their beliefs. That's right. Or the thigh, the thigh and the shin bones had special. Yeah. This is a discussion that I'm not learn it enough to get into properly but i know having discussed it with a couple of archaeologists a few years ago uh, they would always say look there's nothing in the material record to suggest a link between ireland and egypt uh, so there's no smoking gun as it were and uh, don't worry uh, don't spend too much time getting sucked in by these stories of the egyptian prince that was allegedly buried with uh, Egyptian faience beads around his neck at uh, the Mount of the Hostages in Tara uh, because there's absolutely no proof that those beads are Egyptian. I mean, in fact, um, they're more likely to originate in, in England. They were more likely manufactured in England. But anyway, it doesn't stop lots of people getting in, sucked in by these conspiracy theories. Uh, but it's always good to consider the options. There's a, there's a connection uh, with Egypt suggested in Irish mythology, which means, in my opinion, it's something you should not rule out altogether. Uh, but certainly um, be, be wary, uh, especially, uh, Darren, and, and anybody who's kind of uh, studied. And by, I mean, if, uh, by, by saying study, I mean, if, if, if your study is on the internet and is not in the uh, uh, academic libraries and, and uh, papers, just be very, very careful of all of that material pertaining to British Israelism, which makes a lot of very bold claims, most of which are uh, nonsense, actually. Uh, but that's another uh, day's episode, I think, you know. Bethany says, thank you. We'll order. Brilliant stuff, Bethany. Thank you, indeed. For example, Mananon MacLear, whose name is associated with the Isle of Man, may have been some sort of sea divinity. Angus, often called Mach Og, son of Boan, the Boyne, and the, uh, the Dagda, is regarded by some students of mythology as a sort of Irish Adonis. He's a lover, isn't he? He doesn't, he's not interested in politics. In fact, he shuns the kingship of the Dedanans. And I think um, Bov Jarag uh, takes the kingship instead. And they're related, aren't they? Bov is Dagda's brother. Which I think, which would make Bov Jarug Angus's uncle, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, A Angus, the point is that Angus shuns politics. He's far more interested in love. Nina says, Can we get your book in America? Yes, I ship worldwide. Uh, and as I, I, I said earlier in the episode, Nina, uh, and you may have missed it, so there's no problem. Um, uh, quite often, uh, books to the States uh, arrive within a week. And now that's not guaranteed, sometimes it takes longer. Um, but I ship worldwide, uh, and uh, all the copies that I ship from here are signed copies. Nua de Silverarm, Lou Longarm, and the Dogda are also, according to the mythologically minded, partially humanized ancient Celtic divinities. The selections included below, under the Tales of the Tua de Danon, belong, with one or two exceptions, to the so called mythological cycle. We'll read on a little bit, I think. We'll read on at the beginning of the Dedanans. Is everybody comfortable? Is everybody still okay? I don't see Neil and Mary in the house with the film August Tay. Uh, and I don't see Tom King. So I, I'm not sure what way people are fixed in terms of drams or uh, brews. Uh, all I have tonight is a glass of water, uh, for the record. But somebody earlier on in the episode did suggest that whiskey is a good cure for a dry, tick tickly throat. So I'm certainly going to take uh, the medicinal Jemson, uh, a small measure of Jemson. 
And if that doesn't work, I'll have to try another small measure of Jemison. And if that doesn't work, and so on and so on. Desiree says, mine both came within eight days. And that was with all our hurricanes. Brilliant stuff. Excellent. Good. Nina says, thank you. I look forward to getting your books. Brilliant stuff. Yvette is drinking apple cider. Now, that's just not fair. I mean, first of all, it's a pandemic. And secondly, we're separated by 3,000 miles. I mean, I would like to taste. I presume that's home brewed, uh, Yvette. I think uh, several of the uh, Mythflix Tua uh, tend to brew their own. Whiskey and honey, says Desiree. Yeah. Do you know what? I am one of these old-fashioned whiskey drinkers, you know, and so there's a saying in Ireland, and I don't know whether you've heard it elsewhere, you know, when when, when a bar person asks you, uh, do you want ice in your whiskey or do you want water in your whiskey, the the the, the Puritan, uh, Puritan <laughs> sounds like somebody who's religious, uh, those who are uh, diehard whiskey drinkers will always say, if I want water, I'll ask for water. If I, if I want whiskey, I love whiskey. In other words, you just get whiskey on its own, you know. When I drink whiskey, I drink whiskey. When I drink water, I drink water. Ne and never the twain shall meet. The narratives assembled under the title Book of Invasions or Occupations, and that is, of course, Laura Gowala, Aaron, are the literary embodiment of Ireland's own impressions regarding the history of her population. For the early Irish, they served somewhat the same functions as the accounts of the wanderings of Aeneas did for the Romans. To say, as some have done, that the, quote, book of invasions, unquote, is a collection of Irish mythology, is to give an entirely wrong impression of its contents. Okay, hang on a second. We're getting... We're getting uh, the distractions tonight are actually nice. Alwyn is distracting us now. In Tibetan Buddhism... The kang kangling is a trumpet traditionally made from a human femur. Wow. Kangling literally translates to bone flute, said to have a haunting sound. The kangling is typically used in rituals to summon spirits in order to help relieve their worldly sufferings. A damaru, hand drum and kangling are used together in ritual. Wow. Didn't know that, Alwyn. Uh, thank you. Uh, Paula is reminding me to warm the glass. Certainly will do that. Larissa Kama says, yes. Patricia Wardell says, I love a Jemson. Bit hard to get here in Trieste. Oh, sorry to hear that. It's quite easy to get. Sorry, better not rub it in. It's quite easy to get over here. I'll share a cup of tea with all of you, says Nina. Brilliant stuff. Uh, thank you. Uh, a, a virtual share. Bethany Cutler says, purchase complete. Thanks, Bethany. That's great. Thank you indeed. America has ruined me like a good bourbon. Or a not so good one, lol. I have on occasion drank the cheap stuff out of the supermarkets when you're desperate. The honey is good for a scratchy throat and local honey helps boost immune system. <clears throat> so I only add honey when filling up, when filling under the weather feeling, I presume. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, I find if I take honey for too many days in a row, uh, I get a, it, it's like it sticks to my esophagus. I don't know if any of you have that. Um, I like honey. Uh, I really do. Coda's getting quite agitated tonight. He's very excitable out there altogether. There must be cats entering his territorial domain. Uh, I find that um, uh, I can only take it for a couple of days otherwise. Uh, water wrecks a good single malt, says Saibi. I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, to say, as some have done, that the Book of Invasions is a collection of Irish mythology is to give an entirely wrong impression of its contents. Some of the characters, it is true, may be rationalised gods, but the stories as they now stand belong rather to pseudo-history than to mythology. Yes, <laughs> Paula Snow Queen says, Coda, leave the cats alone. Uh, for example, Emer, e Eber and Eremon, though represented in the narrative as ancient kings, are in fact merely fictitious personages with names made up from the ancient name of Ireland, spelled in the earliest manuscripts as Eru, Ifada, or Iu, leading to the modern Irish version of uh, the name, which is Eire, uh, and Ireland coming from Ireland. Ireland. Modern students of early uh, Irish history are inclined to see, underlying these obviously fictitious narratives, a substratum of fact and to regard the account as reflecting in a general way an historical record <coughs> of early population groups. 
The present version is preserved only in rather late manuscripts, but the ancient origin of at least some parts of it is convincingly supported by comparison with the early forms of the British Latin history of the Britons, Historia Brit Britonum. The selections presented below are not continuous, but they form tolerably unified sections describing the arrival of three different groups of immigrants. The first of the divisions here given is preceded in the complete text by the account of the arrival of Partholome and his people. Excuse me. The account of the Tua de Danon serves as a background for the second battle of Moitura, and we covered that indeed in an early Irish, uh, in one of our early uh, live Irish myths episodes. And the fate of the children of Turin, which we also uh, covered. Um, uh, that comprehensive list uh, of episodes, which was very nicely compiled for us by Germone, I must publish somewhere on, perhaps on the website. Um, what did I say? Uh, the fate of the sons of Turin or the fate of the children of Turin, uh, I think was one of the earliest episodes, wasn't it? Um, Second Battle of Moitura was episode five of Live Irish Myths. I, I think we did the Sons of Turin in one of, in perhaps episode one, did we? Let me just check that for a moment. I apologize for becoming thoroughly distracted here. Um, oh, look, maybe it's not important. You'll be able to find it with a quick search. Just pardon, forgive me for a moment. Um, my dogs keep running outside and then back in through the dog door looking for what Coda is barking at, says Desira. I'm actually going to let him in. Um, I'm going to let him in into the kitchen. So just allow me one moment, please, while I do that. Come on. In you go. Now, of course, there's no guarantee that he will stop barking because what sometimes happens is he comes into the kitchen and he, hear, he hears noise outside and he still barks. So distractions are the theme tonight, says Bethany. Well, we're all trying to distract ourselves from the news and, you know. I think we need to summon the gods. The conquest of Mehmed. Now, Ireland was waste 30 years after the plague burial of Partholone's people. And of course, uh, we saw, uh, is, is it a uh, uh, full Irish GK? Are you in, in Tala? Tala Muncher Partholone, the graves of Partholone's people. Till Nemed, son of Agnamon, son of Pamp, son of Tai, son of Sir, son of Sru, son of Esru, son of Bramant, son of Eichek. Eichicht, son of Magog, etc., etc., of the Greeks of Scythia, reached it. Now, this is the account of Nemed. He came from Scythia westward, arrowing the Caspian Sea. So here again, we have this idea that some of the peoples who arrived into Ireland arrived from the Mediterranean region, from Spain, from uh, further afield, sometimes from Egypt. Uh, you always have to be very, very careful with this, remembering this is a pseudo historical account. Uh, till he reached in his wandering the great northern ocean. Marie Lendon is in the house and says, Good day and good evening, everyone. Hello, Falcha. 34 ships were his number and 30 in each ship. While they were thus wandering, there appeared to them a golden tower on the sea close by them. An apparition as such. Thus it was when the sea was in ebb, the tower appeared above it. And when it flowed, it rose above the tower. Nemed went with his people towards it for greed of the gold. From the greatness of their covet, covet, covetousness, covetousness for it, there's a biblical word if ever I saw one, they did not perceive the sea filling around them, so that the eddy took their ships from them all but a few, and their crews were drowned except those of them whom Nemed and his children rescued by dint of rowing. Sounds a little bit uh, a little bit like a Noah's Ark kind of story. And of course, Kezair was the first of the arrivals. She was a granddaughter of Noah. And that's the attempt to try and tie it in with biblical history. 
And, and of course, there's always the temptation to draw uh, analogies here with the Malaysian fleet that was wrecked uh, or partly wrecked on its way back to Ireland, uh, having gone over the, the, uh, the nine waves. Uh, and also to think in, in historical terms of the actual Spanish Armada uh, that was wrecked off the west coast of Ireland, was that in the 15th century? A year and a half were they after that, wandering on the sea till they reached Ireland. They remain in it. Now, as for Nemed, he had four chiefs with him, Starn, Urbanel, the prophet, Fergus Redside, and Ainin. They were the four sons of Nemed. Macha was the name of his wife. Maeve, Mahu, Iba, YBA, that's very unusual because that there's no uh, Irish... Uh, words beginning with Y, so that's very unusual. Yba Iba, which is obviously a a, 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 um, a bastardization or a corruption of an of an Irish name. And Kera C E R A were the names of the wives of the chieftains he had. The twelfth day after they reached Ireland, the wife of Nemed died. She was the first dead in Ireland from among them. Four lake bursts over Ireland in the time in the time of Nemed. Look, Colin. E. Mielon, Luch Munramore, yeah, there's a slight issue with the typography there, of Schlieve Gura, Luch Jarbrech, and Luch Anyin in Meath. At the end of nine years after their coming to Ireland, these last two lakes burst forth. Two royal forts were dug by Nemed in Ireland, Rath Kin Ech in E. Mielon, and Rath. Kimbaith in Semne, the four sons of Madon Fatneck of the Fomorians. <laughs> I love that name. Madon Fatneck. Dug Rath Kinech in one day. Buck, Robok, Ribnya, and Rodan were their names. For they were kept in servitude by Nemed with their father, Madan, before they completed the excavation. Twelve plains were cleared by Nemed in Ireland in servitude, likewise, namely Mac Mag Kera and Mag Eba in Connacht, Mag Tochar in Tyrone, Lech, Lech Mag in Munster, Mag in Mernsa in Leinster, Mag Quilla Tullod in Connacht, Mag Lugud in Eturche, Mag Serad in Tethba, Mag Senni in Dal Aride, Mag Lurg in Connacht, Mag Morhevna in Conele and Mag Macha in Argyla, in, in Oriel. Nemed won three battles over the Fomorians, namely the Battle of Murbolog in Dalriada, where fell Stern, <coughs> son of Nemed, at the hands of Conan, son of Fabar, in Lethed of Lachtmag in Murbolog, the Battle of Ross Frechen in Connacht, which is called the Battle of Bagna. There fell two kings of the Fomorians, namely Gon and Sengon, and the Battle of Knovros in Leinster, where fell a slaughter of the men of Ireland, where Bjorn, son of Starn, fell by Nemed by the same Conon. Knovros, which is very interesting, the point of the bones, obviously for the bones associated with the slaughter. Moreover, by Nemed were these three battles won, although his people suffered great hurt in them. Nemed died afterwards of plague in the island of Ard Nemed in Eliahan in Munster, uh, and 3,000 with him. So there we go. The Fomorians, or sorry, the um, Partholonians died of a plague, and apparently the Nemedians also died of a plague. Now there was a great oppression on the children of Nemed after that, since their champions and their chieftains were destroyed in the aforesaid battles. And since Nemed died with the number we have mentioned, those at whose hands they suffered that oppression were Conan, son of Fabar of the Fomorians, and Mork, son of Della, the other chief. The fortress of Conan, is it Conan or Conan? Conan at the time was at Tor Conan, which is called Toronish Ketne to the northwest of Ireland. A sheep land was made of Ireland by them, so that not a venture was made to let smoke be seen by day from a house that was in it, except with the consent of the Fomorians. Oh, Tom King is in the house. Hello, Tom. Folge. Welcome along. Good to see you. Barbara Murphy is there. Hello, Barbara. 
Doris O'Hara says, hi, everyone. I'm late today. Late shift. That's OK. Perfectly understandable. You're welcome along. We're still reading from um, Ancient Irish Tales. Somebody's saying I should have given Coda a key. <laughs> He'd be clever enough to. <clears throat> um, where was I? Two thirds of their corn, their milk and their children. We mentioned this, didn't we, the other night? With other intolerable burdens, the Fomorians used to demand. We mentioned this in our episode about Samhain, Live Irish Myths, episode 123 the other night. This is what was given to them, and the men of Ireland had to deliver every item to them, always on Samhain Eve, Halloween, at my Ketchne. For this reason, my Mog or my M-I-E-G-H, when, when it is lenited. For this reason, it, was call, it is called my Ketchne. For the frequency they had to pay the heavy tax there to the Fomorians. And the men of Ireland had a byword at that time, asking one another, quote, is it to the same plane, my Ketchne, the tax will be brought on this occasion, unquote. So that thence was the plane named. Now wrath and rage seized the children of Nemed for the heaviness of their distress and for the injuriousness of the tax, their tax, so that their three chieftains plotted to cause their people throughout Ireland to collect and assemble so that they should arrive at one place. They acted accordingly, and having reached one spot, they resolved on one council to proceed to Conan's tower to demand alleviation of their oppression from the Fomorians or to fight with them. These were their chieftains, Fergus Redside, son of Nemed, Semion, son of Irbanel, son of Nemed, and Erglan, son of Bion, son of Starn, son of Nemed. There were other princes and nobles in that assembly besides, with Arthur the Great, son of Nemed, A-R-T-U-R, interesting, and Alma One Tooth, son of Nemed, etc., 30,000 on sea and the same number on land was the number of the children of Nemed that went to that destruction. Besides foreigners, wastrels and a rabble, which they brought to increase their muster against the oppression of the Fomorians. After they had reached the shore of Thoranish, they made booths and huts about the borders of the bay. They then resolved on the council. Then they resolved on the council to send Alma One Tooth to Conan to ask a respite in the matter of the tax to the end of three years. Alma went and reached the fortress of Conan. When he heard his speech, Conan was enraged with the martial prince, so that he got no good of his journey. Alma returned to his people and told them the words of the chief downcast were they at hearing them and they induced Alma to go back again to ask a respite of one year of Conan to show him their poverty and need to bear witness to their inability to produce their the heavy tax of that year and to promise that it should come to him in its fullness at the end of that time they said to him further unless he should obtain the remission he was asking to proclaim battle against Conan for they well nigh preferred to fall together in one place, men, women, and boys and girls, than to be under the great distress in which they were any longer. Alma went forward to Conan and told him the words of the children of Nemed in his presence. They will get the grace, said Conan, on condition that they neither separate nor scatter from one another, till the end of that year so that I and the Fomorians get them in one place for their destruction unless they pay the tax in full at the end of the grace Alma returned to his brothers and told them the news they then accepted it in the hope that they should send messengers to their brothers and their original stock in Greece to ask the help of an army from them against the Fomorians for Relbeo, daughter of the king of Greece, was mother of those of two of those children of Nemed, Fergus Redside and Alma One Tooth. Small son of Esmol was king of Greece at that time. When the messengers from Ireland reached Greece, Small caused the nobles of Greece to come and assemble together in common. 
so that he brought together an immense host of the choice of warriors, of druids and druid, dru, dru, druid, druidesses, <laughs> sorry, of wolves and venomous animals throughout the coasts. He sends them before to the children of Nemed, and himself joins them afterwards with the full muster of the Greeks, and they all set out for Ireland. The progress of that voyage is not related up to the time they took harbour at Conon's Tower. Welcoming were the children of Nemed to them, and this was agreed upon them uh, sorry, agreed upon by them after their arrival to declare war on Conon unless he yielded them their freedom. They send messengers to him about this. Conon was enraged with them after hearing their speech, so that he agreed to give battle. The messengers went back to their people. Conon sent for Morc, son of Della, the other prince of the Fomorians. Notwithstanding, he thought it inglorious to delay answering the battle at once, for he felt sure that the children of Nemed were not ready to undertake battle with him on account of the valour and multitude of his host. Then the men of Ireland sent a spy to the tower of Conon, namely Relbio, daughter of the king of Greece, who came in the host of her children. A druidess was she, and she went in the form of the concubine of Conon to the tower, so that she was with him in lover's wise for a while, through the confusion of his mind. A battle was begun first between their druids and another between their druidesses, and that it went, sorry, so that it went against the Fomorians. In short, every battle which was fought for a while after that went against the Fomorians, so that their people were destroyed to a great extent. A wall strong and hard to pull down was made by the children of Nemed near the tower after that, at the advice of their spy, and they sent the hurtful animals the Greeks had brought to their assistance to the tower, so that they breached every quarter and every side of it before them. And the attacking party went on their trail through the ways they made forward to the tower. The mighty men of the tower were not able to remain within it because of the strength and venom of the hurtful, strange animals mingled with them. Conan, with his war squadrons, fled at once, and he thought it ignoble not to attack the hosts face to face. For he considered it easier to give them battle than to wait in the tower for the wild venomous beasts who came through the walls after they had destroyed them. The attacking host after that secured both hounds and venomous swine after the warriors had left the tower. They then left a guard over it and proceeded to the combat. Each of them took his battle duties upon him on his side and that, on this side and that. Uh, after they had been thus fighting together for a while, this was what happened. Conon fell by the hand of Fergus Redside, son of Nemed, in fair fight. The Fomorians had two valiant knightly warriors besides, beside that, Gilkas, son of Fabar, and or Orkifanat, and the Fomorians closed round them after losing their leader. They took to rising high their warlike efforts and their deeds of valour, till the children of Nemed remembered their hostility and their cruelty to them up until then. So Semyon, son of Starn, son and Gilkas, son of Fabar, were matched as well as Irbanel and uh, Orkifanat. That's a very strange name. O-R-C-I-F-A-N-A-T. Orkifanat. This was the end of it, that the Fomorians were beheaded by the hands of those warriors who happened to be matched against them. The battle at last went against the tribe of the Fomorians and the men of Ireland took to encircling them and surrounding them so that not a fugitive escaped from them. The host proceeded to the tower and took its treasures, its gold, its silver and all its valuables in general. And that is definitely, uh, certainly, certainly brings to mind uh, the Viking raids on the monasteries uh, in the 9th and 10th centuries uh, uh, when the uh, treasures were plundered often from uh, within the confines of the Klugchak or the uh, the round towers. They put fires at every quarter to it after that, so that not higher was its smoke than its flame. Uh, 
It's women and women servants. It's boys and girls were burnt and not a fugitive escaped from it. It does. It does. That last foregoing paragraph uh, sounds a little bit like a Viking raid on a monastery. The children of Nemed shared the booty of the tower among the nobles and the great men of the Greeks before parting from them, and they were grateful one towards the other. Now the children of Nemed stayed in the place of conflict after the departure of the Greeks from them, burying those of their nobles who were slain. Not long, uh, not long were they thus when they saw a full great fleet approaching them. <laughs> Three score ships was its number, teeming with a choice of warriors, led by Mork, son of Della, the other chief of the Fomorians, coming to help Conan. They landed in their presence. The children of Nemed went to hold the harbour against them, uh, though they were worn out. For this was their resolve, not to suffer the Fomorians any longer to frequent Ireland. Kathy May Dayo says, oh, what a treat. Second day in a row on my lunch break. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. Hello, Tua. <laughs> Hello, indeed, Kathy. Hope you're enjoying your lunch break. Welcome along. How be it, <clears throat> although great was the, dis the despite and hatred of Mork, it does say despite, uh, 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 of Mork, son of Della, against the children of the Nemen before that, it was far the greatest on that occasion. A hot, desperate battle was fought between them on every side. Such was the intensity of the fighting and the greatness of the mutual hostility that they did not perceive the gigantic wave of the tide filling up on every side about them. For there was not any heed in their minds but for the battle feats alone, so that the majority were drowned and annihilated, except the people of one ship of the Fomorians and one group, 30 men of the children of Nemed. The crew of that ship arrived back and they told their news to the people and they were downcast at hearing it. I'm sure they were. As for the 30 warriors of the children of Nemed who escaped from that destruction, the three chieftains that were over them divided Ireland into three parts between them after that. These are the chieftains, Bjohach, son of Irbanel, son of Nemed, Semion, son of Erglan, son of Bjorn, son of Starn, son of Nemed, and Britain, yes, B R I T A I N, and Britain, son of Fergus Redside, son of Nemed. The third of Bjohok, first from Thorinish to the Boyne to Belach Conglish, the third of Semion from the Boyne to Belach Conglish, the third of Britain from Belach Conglish to Thorinish Ketchne. However, they did not abide long by that division without separating and scattering into other countries over sea. For they stood in fear of the Fomorians, lest what remained of them should wreak their resentment upon them after the battles that had been fought between them. Another cause, they themselves were not friendly or heart-loving one to the other. And then, in addition, they, are, they were terrified of the plagues uh, by which the troops of their chieftains and of their men had died before the storming of the tower. So for these causes, they separated one from the other. These are the lands whither they went. Simeon, with his nine to the lands of Greece, he had gone after the death of his father to Ireland, Britain and his father, Fergus Redside, to Mon Conoin in Britain. The foregoing prose account is followed by a versified treatment ascribed to the poet Yochi O Flan, who died A.D. 1003. And so that is the story of the uh, sons of Nemed, or the Nemedians, um, and their arrival. And, of course, this is a summary of what is in uh, Laura Gawala, the book of Invasions, the Conquest of Nemed. Uh, that is followed by the Conquest of the Fir Volok, which we're not reading because we've gone over the hour. Uh, we'll come back to this stuff. The Conquest of the Tuatha de Danann, which I think we've covered uh, in previous episodes of Live Irish Myths. The Conquest of the Sons of Meal, also covered, uh, although we still have to do more about Amrigin in particular. Uh, and that is a lengthy enough one. And that's the Book of Invasions. It then proceeds to retell the story of uh, Cot Moitura, the Second Battle of Moitura. Uh, our friend uh, Morgan Daimler has recently finished uh, uh, a translation, a new translation of Kotmoy Chura, and that will be very interesting to read. I'm not sure how that's been released. 
I believe it's behind a paywall at the moment. I might ask or Morgan for more details about that because I'm sure a lot of you, like myself, will be very interesting interested in reading it. And then the story of the fate of the children of Turin. Uh, that was one of our early episodes of Live Irish Myths. Um, yeah, again, uh, we did mention that and I couldn't find it in the list, but I think it's one of the first episodes. It might be episode two or something like that. Um, or was it later than that? I'm doubting myself now. Oh, the Sons of Ishnok was three episodes. Yeah, uh, I think the Sons of Terran were were perhaps an uh, episode two, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, we can look that up later. Um, and following that, then, and that takes us up to page. We're already on page eighty-two. Is the wooing of Etain Tuchmark Etain? Uh, we've covered that, definitely. Then the destruction of Dodd Deriga's Hostel, probably our longest uh, series in Live Irish Myths, uh, back to back. We did 67, 68, 69, and 74 episodes. And that's where we came up with that repetitive phrase, not difficult, that, tell me what you see, you know. Uh, and uh, we're not going to repeat that tonight, definitely not. But the destruction of Dodd Deriga's Hostel is in there. The birth of Kunkobar. Uh, the birth of Cúchulainn, then we proceed to uh, the Ulster cycle, the boyhood deeds of Cúchulainn, uh, the wooing of Emer, Tuchmark, Emera, etc., etc. And we forward to uh, MacDaho's Pig, which we covered in uh, the previous, wasn't it? Was that episode five of Book Talk recently, or was that episode four? MacDaho's Pig was from uh, Irish Sagas. That's book, book Talk episode four, two episodes ago. Um, the cattle raid of Regauna, the intoxication of the Ulster men, that's from the Ulster cycle, the exile of the sons of Ishnak. We've covered that, that's Deirdre, and the story of the twining branches, Brick Roo's feast, which we haven't done yet uh, on Live Irish Myths, but we will get around to it, and the cattle raid of Cooley, which we have to do, obviously, that's a long one. Uh, the death tales of the Ulster heroes, uh, and then begins the cycle of Finn, which sort of begins the, the the third third of the book the third segment of the book anyway um that has been uh, ancient irish tales highly recommended uh, it's been in my library since 1999 that's one of the longest uh, uh, uh serving um uh, 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 tomes in the library it runs to as i say over 600 pages and uh, uh because of its well, this is the, as I said, the Barnes and Noble 1996 reprint. Because it's in hardback, it, it just tends. I just find that the hardbacks wear very well. Uh, and although it has been thumbed a lot, a lot over the years, and there are passages underlined and markings in the margins, uh, it has survived quite well and still looks very fresh despite its 21 uh, year age. Let me see if there are any comments uh, or questions before I depart. People are already saying goodbye. Oh, well, no problem. Take it easy. And don't forget, if we don't do anything between now and then, uh, we'll be doing uh, part two of our exploration of the Festival of Samhain or the celebration of Samhain uh, next Monday. Uh, Samhain is officially in two days' time. On Saturday uh, is the 7th. That is the cross-quarter date between the equinox and the solstice. We'll be talking about the astronomical date of Samhain, and we'll be talking more about ancient Samhain alignments in our next episode of Live Irish Myths. I don't know about the next episode of Book Talk. They can happen any time uh, because it's just a matter of pulling a book off the shelf and telling you a little bit about it and maybe doing a little bit of reading. Uh, Desiree says, thank you so much for helping us all escape for a little while. Anthony, you're the best. Well, thanks, Desiree. I'm very glad to provide the forum. It is uh, my honour and duty and pleasure to do so, to provide a little bit of an arena in which we can all come together virtually. <laughs> Our little sort of... Uh, distracting safe place um tom king is telling his children stories brilliant stuff i love it elaine dent lingenfelter says well heck i'm late not to worry elaine but you can catch up fairly quickly because on both facebook and youtube the videos are available fairly quickly afterwards so hopefully you can catch up with everything that uh, we've said
Okay, I think I've caught up with everything. I hope so. Alwyn says, thank you for this great distraction, Anthony. Have a peaceful night all. Yes, indeed. And the same to all of you. I really like the recent Irish saga book you introduced, edited by Miles Dillon. Yeah, uh, absolutely. One of the must-haves. Uh, and again, I can go back to that in Live Irish Myths. We can read uh, another one or two of those, most certainly, uh, definitely. Anne Hurley says, thank you so much for your enlightenment, as always, Anthony. And to all the lovely people, keep safe and keep sane. Love and light to all. And all the same to you, and My very best regards. And stay safe and stay well. And to all of you who are now uh, leaving this uh, virtual space for, for, for the moment, dismantle the fear and anxiety. Feed their imagination, says Tom King. Absolutely. Try and get their heads out of the screens a little bit, he says, doing live streams, which require people to watch on screens. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, that's quite contradictory, isn't it? Anyway, I also write books <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I'm a big lover of them. So a good night from me in the Boyne Valley here in Drogheda in County Louth. Very close to County Meath, by the way. And uh, we'll see you very soon. Um, probably do something of an episode of some sort of a live stream uh, over the weekend, hopefully. Uh, perhaps we might do one on Saturday, coinciding with the cross-quarter date. Um, but if not, and if you're not able to join us, we'll see you on Monday evening next for episode 124 of Live Irish Mits. In the meantime, stay safe, stay well, keep washing your hands, using the hand sanitizer, socially distancing, use cough and sneeze etiquette, wear a mask, keep yourself safe and keep yourself well so you can keep coming back and enjoying these and so that I can keep enjoying your company. All the very best from Ireland. Ikhawa, good night. Kolosov, sound sleep, slán gafol, bye for now. And of course, most importantly of all, tog gupogé. Take it easy. Bye bye.